All right, everyone. Uh, so we're going to try this video lecture thing and see how it goes. Um, so one of the things you guys are probably going to notice while I'm doing this is the fact that uh, whenever I click, it makes a pretty noticeable sound. Um, but hopefully, otherwise, this isn't too bad. Um, yeah, be sure to give me some feedback on how you like these, and we'll see maybe in the future if we can do more. Uh, but we'll just see how this one goes first. All right, so today's lesson is about 6.3. We're going to be studying something that potentially you studied in AP Calculus, if you took that. Uh, this is called volume by slicing. Uh, and in this section, the main idea is that we're going to try and find volume of three-dimensional shapes. All right, so before we get into that, let's recall some things from Calculus 1. So the first thing that we want to recall is how exactly we calculate um, areas underneath curves. So the first thing to note is that whenever we estimate the area under a curve, we end up using a Riemann sum, right? And so remember that this is just using a bunch of rectangles to estimate the area underneath the curve, Riemann sum. I'm using a mouse to write this, and so it's going to be a little bit worse handwriting, so I apologize for that in advance. Uh, whenever we use a Riemann sum, as you can see in this picture down here, we're going to divide the interval into n subintervals, and then each of those is going to have a width of delta x, and then we pick some point in the middle of that subinterval. So let's say we're looking at just this tiny little subinterval. We pick some point in there, and then we build a rectangle with a height of f of x k star. Uh, so f of x, or sorry, x k star is just some point within that subinterval, um, and it has a width of delta x. So the basic idea is that the uh, width is going to be the same for every single one of these rectangles, but the height obviously will be different depending on where the function is, and so that's why it's f of x k star. Uh, you don't need to worry too much about this. Um, but the idea is that we're going to estimate the area under the curve by using rectangles and summing their areas. And then as the number of rectangles approaches infinity and delta x gets closer and closer to zero, the Riemann sum exactly uh, calculates the area underneath a curve. All right. Um, but the idea now is that we have to figure out what we want to do if we want to find the volume of a three-dimensional object. All right. So the general idea is we have to suppose that we want to find the volume of a 3D object below. So we're going to start by trying to estimate its volume. Um, and this is going to be very similar to a Riemann sum. So instead of using rectangles to estimate area, we're going to end up using these shapes over here, which we are going to call prisms. Um, to estimate the volume of the whole shape. And I just want to double check and make sure I'm actually recording. So let me, let me double check that. Okay, I'm good. All right, so we are estimating the volume. Uh, by increasing the number of prisms, we're eventually going to get a better and better estimate for the volume of the whole object. So the volume of one prism, uh, I want you guys to think about this for a second. If you want to, pause the video. Uh, think about what the volume of just one of these little prisms is going to be. Let's say that we know that the area of the base of the prism has uh, area AX, or just A. So the volume then of that prism is just going to be A of X times delta x, where delta x is obviously just the width of that prism. All right, does that make sense? Um, and so if we end up doing this, let me go back. If we end up doing this and we get the width to get closer and closer to zero, we increase the number of prisms, uh, this eventually is going to exactly calculate the volume of the object. And this little graphic down here at the right 
demonstrates how that works. This is basically a Riemann sum, but for three-dimensional objects. All right. So to put this formally, uh, suppose that we have a solid object which extends from x equals a to x equals b, and the cross-section of the solid perpendicular to the x-axis has an area given by the function a of x that is integrable on the interval a to b. The volume of that solid is calculated by just v equals the integral from a to b of the area function of x dx. So um, this requires a little bit of piecing. Uh, the first thing that we notice is that we must have x, a solid which extends from x equals a to x equals b. So imagine that you draw a line out in space and you have some solid that just exists along that line. So this graphic down here demonstrates that fairly well. You know, you've got a solid object which extends from x equals a right here to x equals b. Moreover, you need to be able to find the area of every cross-section of this shape. So like if I were to pick just any x point right here, let's say this is x, uh, you should be able to tell me what this cross-sectional area, uh, what the area of that cross-section is going to be. And so that's what we mean by knowing the cross-sectional area a of x. And so that's what this second statement here is about. We know that the cross-section of the solid perpendicular to the x-axis has an area given by the function a of x. If we don't know this function, then this method is not useful. Furthermore, this needs to be integrable. That should never be an issue for us. And then we can just calculate the volume using this very simple formula. Um, so yeah, this node is basically what I've just said. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into an example. Uh, the words on here are going to be pretty confusing, so we'll try and run through it slowly. First, we're going to let R be the region in the first quadrant bounded by the coordinate axes and Y equals 1 minus X squared. So before we read the rest of this problem, let's just draw what that is. So here is our first quadrant. The function Y equals 1 minus X squared is a portion of a circle. Uh, so if we were to draw that entire function, it would actually be this thing. But since we're only concerned about the first quadrant, we are just worried about what happens in here. So this is our region R. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and so this has a value of 1. It intersects the y-axis at 1. And it also intersects the x-axis at 1 right there. Let me draw this one pretty also. OK. So that's our region R. We're going to say that a solid has this base and that its cross sections through the solid perpendicular to the base and parallel to the y-axis are squares. All right. so. We are looking at cross sections through the solid perpendicular to the base, so perpendicular to uh, this base R here, and parallel to the y axis, and those are squares. So the best thing to demonstrate this is just to look at these pictures down below. So you'll notice that this is the cross section, this plane is perpendicular to the base. Notice how this plane is perpendicular to this base plane. It is also parallel to the y-axis. And so that essentially is what we are going for here. Um, and so this is the cross-section that we're talking about. And then if you end up building this solid for every point x along the x-axis, you end up with this lovely solid over here. So now you'll notice that at any point x, the cross-section is just a square. So I could draw it like this. That's a terrible square, but I think you get the idea. At every point x, this is a cross-sectional square. So 
With this in mind, we can find the volume of the solid. To do that, let me switch colors, we are just going to use the formula that we know. It's the integral from A to B of capital A of X dx. So take a second, think about what A and B are, and then also what this area function should be. Feel free to pause the video. Alright, so the idea is that since we are looking at the x-axis, the integral should go from 0 to 1, and the area function is the area of this square, of this cross-sectional square. And the area of such a square is just going to be the height of the function, which is y equals 1 minus x squared, and then you square it. Notice how the height here is 1 minus x squared as well. And so the area function, therefore, must be 1 minus x squared quantity squared. All right, and if we uh, write this out a little bit more, we get the integral. You can foil this out. You end up getting 1 minus 2 x squared plus x to the fourth dx. And now we just got to do our favorite thing and integrate this. Uh, we're going to end up with x uh, minus two thirds x to the third power plus x to the fifth over five. This is so much harder to write with a mouse from zero to one. All right, and if we do this calculation, I'll skip the, the boring number part, we're going to end up with 8 over 15. Okay. Um, and then the unit here, if they were to have told us like what the original shape was measured in, would be in some sort of unit cubed, because we're measuring volume. But because no unit is given to us, we'll just write it as 8 fifteenths. All right, and that's how you do that problem. Let's consider the next one. Uh, so actually, uh, let's, we're changing subjects slightly. We're now going to consider a new shape, something called a solid of revolution. Uh, the idea behind this type of solid is you have some sort of 2D region. We're going to call it R. Um, and we are going to revolve that region 360 degrees around an axis, like we do in the figure. So we start off with the 2D region R here, and we are going to revolve this thing 360 degrees around the x-axis, and we have created a solid of revolution. Um, there's several different axes that we could rotate R around, uh, but we're going to start off simple by just considering what happens when we revolve around the x-axis. Okay, so let's do an example. Actually, no, not an example yet. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Um, let's see, I want to I wanna switch colors. All right, so we're going to go away. Uh, so notice that the cross-sections of the solid at any point x within the interval a to b are in the shape of a. If you take a look at these, uh, this cross-section here, you'll notice that this is clearly a circle or we can also call it a disk, which we certainly will later on. So that is a circle. Uh, and the area of a circle is, hopefully you guys remember back from your days in geometry, it is pi times the radius squared. Radius squared. And so let me ask you guys, what is the radius for this picture, for this cross section? Well, hopefully it's fairly evident that it is just f of x. So we can write it like this, pi times f of x quantity squared. All 
All right, so this is our area function. And we know the area for every point x from a to b. And so what we can do is we can calculate the volume using that formula that we came up with in the general slicing method. Um, and we are just going to replace a of x with pi times f of x squared. Fantastic, isn't that convenient? And f of x we call the disk radius. So this is the primary formula that we're going to be concerning ourselves with. Uh, this is called the disk method. So this slide basically just summarizes what I've said. Um, and the textbook's definition, or whatever you want to call it for the disk method, is written here if you want to read through that. This basically just summarizes what I've just said. Uh, one requirement is that we require that f of x is greater than or equal to zero on a particular interval, but it's not too hard to fix this if this is not the case, uh, so don't worry too much about that. Um, and yeah, this is the disk method because every single one of our cross sections is circular and can be thought of as a disk. All right, y'all, this is the third time I'm attempting to record this example because the first two times I messed up. So hopefully this time I can do it correctly. All right, so we're now going to do an example where we use the disk method to find volume. We're going to let R be the, oh, also, there's a typo on your, on your printed out notes, so be sure you fix it. Uh, the function should be f of x plus 1 quantity squared, not x squared plus 1 like I have written down. All right. So we're going to let r be the region in the first quadrant bounded by this function, x equals 2, and the coordinate axes. And our task is to find the volume when r is revolved around the x-axis. So conveniently for us, um, the region r is drawn over here to the left, and the solid that is produced is right beneath it. So to calculate volume, we're going to do the formula, v equals the integral from 0 to 2 of a of x dx. And we know that a of x, in this case, is just the volume of this circular region. And so this is going to be integral from 0 to 2 of pi times the function squared. So this is our function. So let me just write it out for completion. This is going to be x plus 1 squared, but we square it again, the function squared dx. All right. Uh, let's put the pi on the outside, just because. Um, and then we have the integral from 0 to 2. Uh, since we have a square of a square, uh, those get multiplied, and we just end up with x plus 1 to the fourth power. Um, and then we can use a u substitution here to uh, get us to a point where we can integrate this. So think about the u substitution. And the one that we're going to end up using is just x, equal, x plus 1. And so that means that du is equal to dx. Uh, make sure you do say du equals dx and not just du equals 1. Uh, this is a definite integral, so our bounds are going to change as well. We go from 0 to 2 in the x variables. And if we plug in 0 in for x, we're going to get 1 as our lower bound for the u. Uh, bounds, and if we plug in 2, we're going to get 3 as our upper bound. So this is how our bounds will change. And so we end up with the integral, pi integral 1 to 3, u to the fourth, du. And we just have to calculate this. We don't have to worry about going back to x variables. So this is pi u to the fifth over 5 from 1 to 3.
And then if you are a whiz at um, arith arithmetic computations, uh, we have to calculate 3 to the 5th power, which is 243. Uh, and then 1 to the 5th power, hopefully, is obviously just 1. So we're going to end up with 242 over 5. And this is our final answer. So as you can see in this example, all we do is we square the function, put a pi there, we end up having to use a u sub, and we get a nice large number for our volume. Okay, now we're going to complicate life a little bit. Uh, what if instead of uh, having a lower bound that is the x-axis, what if the lower bound of our region is now another function? So you can see in this picture, our region R does not extend all the way to the x-axis like it has been. We don't get this area included in our region. Uh, it actually ends at our lower bound function, g of x. And so whenever you revolve this now around the x-axis, it produces a shape that looks like this. Uh, and this kind of looks like a fancy donut, which is, you know, the way I like to think about this method. We end up with some sort of fancy looking donut. And our objective is to find the volume of this thing that's got a hole in the middle of it. Uh, one of the things that you're going to notice here is that these cross sections are no longer in the shapes of disks but rather they are in the shape of washers, hence the name, washer method. So hopefully you guys know what a washer looks like. It's just essentially, um, you know, a, a, a circle with a hole in the middle of it. That's a washer. All right. So now we're going to ask ourselves what the area inside of an individual washer is. And we're going to use these pictures down here as guides. And this will help us to determine, in general, what our function a of x should be. So first of all, let's take a look at this picture, the one on the left, and try and figure out what the area of this uh, washer is. So one way to think about this is that this is a larger circle with a smaller circle cut out. So we can just take the area of the larger circle, pi r o squared, minus the area of the smaller circle, which is pi r i squared. Uh, you could factor out that pi if you wanted to. You could say that this is pi times r o squared minus r i squared, and then this would be the area of the shape. Um, r o stands for the outer radius, r i stands for the inner radius. So for us, if we have a function f of x, which is the upper radius, the outer radius, and a function g of x, which is the inner radius, the way that we're going to, let me just label these, outer radius and inner radius. The way that we're going to calculate the area of, the, of every individual washer is just pi times f of x squared minus pi times g of x squared. And that is the area for an individual washer. So putting it a little bit more formally, uh, this is how the textbook describes this. Uh, both the functions technically have to be above the x-axis, but we don't worry too much about that. And here you see that the outer radius, f of x, is labeled, and the inner radius, g of x, is also labeled. A super, super, duper, duper common mistake is for people to use this formula, which is wrong. Um, you want to make sure to square f of x and g of x individually, not square their difference. This is bad. Don't do this, please.
You'll make me sad. Now let's do an example. Let's see, do I want to change colors? I probably do. Uh, let's go, let's go with green. All right, so we're gonna let r be the region in the first quadrant bounded by y equals x squared and y equals the square root of x. And we're gonna find the volume of the solid produced when that region is revolved around the x-axis. So first, let's draw it. Here's our first quadrant. The function x squared looks like this. The function square root of x looks like that. This is the square root of x. This is x squared. Um, I think it's fairly obvious that these two are going to intersect at the point 1, 1. Uh, you can prove that by setting the two functions equal to each other if you want to, uh, but hopefully that's fairly straightforward. And so this right here is our region R, this area between the two. All right, um, and so let's use the formula. We're going to use v equals the integral. Uh, so this is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of pi um, times the upper function. So the upper function in this case is the square root of x. So I'm going to take the square root of x squared, and I'm going to subtract pi times the lower function, which in this case is x squared, squared, don't forget the second square, dx. And I can bring the pi to the outside of the integral entirely, so I'm going to factor out a pi, put it over here. I get the integral from 0 to 1. Uh, square of x squared is just x. x squared squared is x to the fourth. All right, and so the integral here is just x squared over 2. This integral is x to the fifth over 5. And then, of course, this is evaluated from 0 to 1. And if we do the calculations, we can actually do this one fairly easily. This is going to be 1 half minus 1 fifth. And then, of course, we would do minus 0 minus 0. Um, and so our final answer, uh, 1 half is the same thing as 5 tenths. 1 fifth is the same thing as 2 tenths. So 5 minus 2 is 3, so we end up with 3 pi over 10. And we did it! Okay, let me double check, make sure that's right. It is, alright. So this is how you would use the washer method to calculate um, the volume of a region, which is rotated around the x-axis. All right, so next slide. Uh, so everything that we've done so far, we've revolved around the x-axis. We can also choose to revolve around the y-axis if we really want to. Um, and then this slide just kind of gives you an idea of what those formulas are going to look like. One thing to note is that whenever we're talking about the outer radius and the inner radius, uh, first of all, all of these must be, all of these functions must be in terms of y. This interval, c to d, must be an interval on the y-axis. So um, maybe c is right here and d is right here. It must be some interval on the y-axis that we're concerning ourselves with. Uh, the functions must be in terms of y. And the outer radius is going to be the one that is farther from the y-axis. So like, let's say this is one function, this is another function then the area that we would concern ourselves with is right here. That would be our region R. 
The outer function would be this guy. That would be the outer radius. And then this would be the inner radius. Okay. Uh, the next slide gives a pretty good idea of what that looks like. Um, and then also the disk method is entirely the same thing. Uh, one thing to note uh, at this point that I probably should have mentioned earlier is that the disk method is actually just a special case of the washer method. The disk method is just the case when the inner radius is zero. Notice how this formula for the washer method is exactly the same as the disk method if q of y is equal to zero. So it is just the case when that inner radius is non-existent. So here are some pictures, some nice lovely pictures. Uh, the interval c to d of course is along the y-axis. This is our region r. The outer radius p of y is the one farther from the x-axis. The inner radius q of y is the one that is closer to the y-axis. So this is the inner radius. And it would create a solid that looked like this guy. Let's do an example. Uh, this sort of question is the kind of thing that's really common on the first exam multiple choice, so do make sure that you have this down pretty well. All right, let's go back to green. Uh, so we're going to let R be the region in the first quadrant bounded by the graphs x equals 4y and x equals y cubed. Set up, but do not evaluate the integrals that calculate the volume of the following solids. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at these functions and I actually want to rewrite them um, in terms of y just to kind of get a picture of how to graph them. So if x is equal to 4y, then y is equal to 1 fourth x. Similarly, if x is equal to y cubed, then y is equal to x to the 1 third power, or the cubed root of x. All right, uh, I want to graph this, so let me add another pen over here. Yeah, black is what I'm looking for. Okay, so the graph of 1 fourth x, let's do our best here. This is not going to be to scale, but hopefully you get the idea. Uh, you know, something like that. And then the graph of x to the 1 third. This is similar to the graph of the square root of x, uh, but it just looks a little bit different. Maybe something like that. And then, of course, it would keep going. It's a terrible drawing, but hopefully you get the idea. So this would be our region R. Uh, and we're going to revolve this thing around the x-axis and the y-axis. So in order to do that, we first of all need to figure out what our intervals of integration are going to be. So specifically, we need to figure out what this point right here is. What x-y coordinate happens right here. In order to figure out that, we need to set the equations equal to each other. So we can either set the x equations equal to each other, so we would say y cubed equals 4y, or we can set the y equations equal to each other. We could say 1 fourth x equals x to the 1 third. Either will work, and either will get you the correct idea. Um, let me just go ahead and set the x equations equal to each other. So we'll say that 4y equals y cubed. In order to solve this, we're not going to divide by y because that might get rid of the solution. Instead, we are going to subtract 4y over and then we can factor out a y. So we get y squared minus 4 equals 0. And so this gives us solutions of y equals 0 and then plus or minus 2. Great. So the one that is evident for us is right here 
So this must occur at y equals 2. What am I doing? That should be a 2. So the y-coordinate of this intersection is 2. The x-coordinate of that intersection, well, if we just plug in 2 into either equation, we're going to realize that 2 is or that the x coordinate must be 8. And so the ordered pair is just 8, 2. Alright, great. Um, let's see, I'm running out of space. Let me see if I can make this smaller or something. I can, that's amazing. Okay. I'll need to remember that. Uh, let's go to orange. All right, so now for part A, uh, we are going to figure out the volume of the solid created when we revolve around the x-axis. So when we revolve around the x-axis, we use x variables. And so the volume is going to be equal to the integral with the x-coordinates 0 to 8 of pi times the upper radius squared, the outer radius squared, and this is the, uh, this corresponds to the cubed root of x equation. So let me write it like this, x to the one-third squared, and then minus pi times the um, inner radius squared, and so that equation is one-fourth x. quantity squared dx. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. For part b, we're now revolving around the y-axis, and so the outer radius, I want you to think to yourself for a second what the outer radius of this thing is going to be. The interval of integration is going to be 0 to 2, because we go from uh, y equals 0 to y equals 2. And we're going to get pi. So the outer radius in this case is the one farther from the y-axis. So that is this guy, which corresponds to 4y. Remember, this must now be in terms of y variables. So we're going to do 4y squared minus pi times y cubed squared dy. And these would be the setups for the volume that we get whenever we revolve around the x-axis and the y-axis, respectively. Uh, note that these calculations will not necessarily be the same, uh, and so a, test, a potential test question might be, you know, figure out which one is larger, which volume is larger. It's a very comprehensive question. All right, now we're going to make our lives a hell of a lot harder, and we're going to consider what happens whenever we revolve around axes that are not the x-axis or y-axis. All right, so this region here, we've got the equations for it. We've got y equals x squared plus 1, y equals the square root of x plus 1. But instead of revolving around the x-axis or y-axis, let's revolve around the line y equals 0.5. So we were revolving around this line. And the, the way that we're going to have to do this is we have to figure out what the outer radius and the inner radius are. So the outer radius is just the distance from our outer function to our line of revolution. So this is our outer radius. Okay? and we need to figure out what that distance is. Similarly, this distance here is our inner radius. And I guess I forgot to mention, we are just going to figure out for this problem what the <coughs> what the equations for the outer and inner radii are respectively. Ooh, losing my voice. Okay. So the distance from the outer function to the line of revolution is just going to be this function 
minus 0.5. Square root of x plus 1 minus 0.5. And I want you to convince yourself of this. Think about what happens if you plug in x equals 1. Or actually, let's start off easy. If you plug in x equals 0 into this outer radius function, then you're going to end up with a distance of 0.5 which makes sense because at x equals 0, so this is the point x equals 0, we uh, should get a distance of 0.5 from the axis of revolution. And we do if we're in this region. Uh, and then as we travel along this function, if we get all the way up to x equals 1, the distance from this function down to this line needs to be, as you can see from the picture, one and a half. That should be one and a half. And indeed, if you plug in one into the square root of x, you're going to get one plus one minus 0.5, which is indeed one and a half. And so this outer radius makes sense. Similarly, the inner radius, let me erase some things to make this a little bit more clear. The inner radius is just going to be the distance from x squared plus 1 to this line, which is just x squared plus 1 minus 0.5. x squared plus 1 minus 0.5. So if we were asked to figure out the volume of this shape revolved around the line y equals 0.5, we would have to take the outer radius uh, or we would have to take the integral from 0 to 1 of pi times the outer radius squared minus pi times the inner radius squared dx. All right. Next, let's consider this example. We are now revolving around the line x equals 2.5. And we need to figure out what the outer radius and inner radius are. So first, let's just draw them in. So the outer radius is the distance from the function farther away from the axis of revolution, which indeed, in this case, is this guy. So this is the outer radius. This is the inner radius. It is the function that is closer to the axis of revolution. All right, uh, so the distance from the farther function, square root of x plus 1, to 2.5, what you need to do is you should subtract 2.5 minus the functions. And the reason we do 2.5 minus the functions, as opposed to the functions minus 2.5, is solely so that way we get a positive value for the distance. So like 2.5 minus square root of x plus 1, if you were to plug in, ooh, 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 sorry, I should be sure to use this hint. So the hint here requires, or the hint tells us that uh, with this one, all of our functions need to be in terms of y. So let's just go ahead and solve this function and this function in terms of y. So y equals x squared plus 1. If we solve this for x, we're going to get x equals uh, the square root of y minus 1. Similarly, if we look at the other one, if we solve this for x, we're going to get x equals uh, y minus 1 quantity squared. Okay, so anytime you're doing a outer radius or an inner radius that are horizontal, you're using a vertical line to um, do your axis of revolution, all of your stuff must be in terms of y. Great. So for us, the distance is going to be 2.5 minus 
y minus 1 squared for the outer radius. So let me just write this down finally. 2.5 minus y minus 1 quantity squared. And then the inner radius is going to be 2.5 minus x squared plus 1. Sorry, I lied again. It's going to be 2.5 minus the square root of y minus 1. Whew. All right, we're almost there, guys. One more slide. And so now if you kind of consider what happens if you plug in any arbitrary point y, let's say I were to plug in y equals 1. Um, then I should expect that the distance should be 2.5. So if I plug in y equals 1 here, I would get indeed a distance of 2.5. If I plug in y equals 1 into this guy, I would also get a distance of 2.5. All right, and then if I plug in y equals 2 into either of these, I should expect a distance of what looks to be 1.5, and, and I believe you can check that on your own if you'd like. All right, now we're going to revolve around a couple different axes using a different region. So uh, the first one is a little bit different. You'll notice that the axis that we're revolving around actually touches our shape. And so the distance for the outer radius is this guy, because this is the function farther away from the axis of revolution. This is the outer radius. The inner radius in this case, let you think about it for a second. The inner radius is just zero. There is no inner radius, right? Like imagine that you were to actually revolve this region around this axis. There would be no fancy hole in the middle. You would not get something that had a weird hole like this. And so what this indicates to us is that this is really going to end up using the disk method as opposed to the washer method. So the inner radius here is just zero. The outer radius is going to be the distance from the axis of revolution to our function in terms of x. So 2 minus x squared plus 1. And if you plug in a point x, you can verify that it is the proper distance. So like for example, if you plug in 0, you'll get 2 minus 1. And the distance right here is indeed 1. OK. Now let's consider this picture over here on the right. And we're revolving around the axis uh, x equals negative 1. All right. So the outer radius, in this case, is going to be this thing. And the inner radius will be this guy. I'm just going to go back for a second and make a note that this used the disk method. All right. So the outer radius on this right-hand picture is going to be the function, but in terms of y. So we know that that function, if we solve for y, is going to be the square root of y minus 1. Um, this function minus negative 1. So. The outer radius is just the square root of y minus 1 minus negative 1. Okay. Um, and then the inner radius is just going to be the distance from this line right here, so this function to this line. And this function is just the function x equals 0 
And this one, of course, is just the line x equals negative 1. And so really, it's just 0 minus negative 1. So the radius in this case, the inner radius, is a constant 1, which makes sense. You can just look at any point y and notice that it's just 1, the distance there. And so, of course, if you wanted to actually calculate the volume, you would have to plug these radii into the proper spots in the function. Um, but hopefully, this little exercise gives you an idea on how to use other axis of rotations for, um, for calculating volume. All right, well, this is arguably the start of some of the harder material that you're going to come across. So hopefully, this lecture made sense. Uh, do give me some feedback on how you like this video lecture and tell me what I can do to improve this because this is the first one I've ever done. Uh, so with that said, um, I have a quiz for you that should be posted on Canvas. I haven't actually made it yet. So um, yeah, do make sure to check Canvas and do that and fill it out by Monday. It'll be due at the beginning of class on Monday. Uh, if it's late, there could be a late penalty, so just make sure to do it over the weekend. Um, and yeah, I will see you guys on Monday. Enjoy your day.